streaming services. Um, we've all already mentioned the floor on the golf uh, this morning. And you know, developing projects which reduce demand in the system. I mentioned the early help that the intervention are doing around uh, uh, social care. Um, and obviously, the more we can do to get our residents back into employment, uh, that, that addresses the, uh, a number of agendas around, um, particularly around the implications for health, and that hopefully will have a knock on effect on reducing the amount of social care. So, all these things are interlinked. Um, but I think those, those, those main kind of um, ways in, of which we're, we're looking at how we address our budget challenge, they are still relevant. Even more relevant given the um, you know the, the context that we've, we're facing nationally. I hope you know I don't want to get into a big discussion about Brexit, but I hope that once the, the Brexit sort of uh, debate's been settled, you know we can actually get the government to focus uh, on on I think the single biggest challenge, which I think is around local government funding and search the social care crisis. But let's hope that that, that comes to pass. So um, I think. The, the main substance of this paper, if you like, is a set of proposals for how we balance the budget next year, and that's set out in Appendix 1. Um, and this is the result of a, of a huge amount of work from cabinet colleagues and uh, officers. Um, and the budget options, the proposals that's happening in, in, in Appendix 1 will form the basis of a detailed consultation process which is set out in paragraph 8.0 of this report on page 100 where we will uh, go out to consult with um, the public and um, there's a number of um, uh, specific scrutiny committee meetings that have been uh, arranged for December. So we'll do that over December and January. Um, I, I give an open invitation that you know, nobody's got a monopoly good idea, so if there are any other suggestions from anywhere about how we can raise more income, save money, which is not on this list, then please, please let us know, because this is the opportunity to do that over the next two months. But we think the proposals set out in Appendix 1 um, are, uh, are worthy of consideration and enable us to get very close to balancing filling that £45 million budget gap that we talked about at the start of this process. So it's a very much open consultation process. We welcome all, all ideas and suggestions and clearly we will then bring them back after, after Christmas to the Cabinet in, in February uh, when we set the budget and then obviously budget, budget council at the start of March of next year when we set the budget. Um, Jeanette, you're, you're absolutely right in the comments you made. This, this is never an easy process. It's never, never um, one that I think is, um, it, is particularly enjoyable, but we are, with the administration, it's our job to balance the budget. And I think this, uh, these proposals which we've got in front of us, um, whilst in an ideal world we won't do any of this, but I'm heartened by the fact that number one, they don't impact on vital frontline public services, and secondly, I, I do think they um, they they open by our you know our administration's values around social justice and protecting those vulnerable, and particularly, I think they are focused on making sure we continue to deliver the world plan and the of budget, which is the, the the kind of heart, if you like, of of, of what we're about, and, and and it forms the basis of the medium-term financial strategy. So all of that being said, um, we, we look forward to what comes out of the consultation um, and uh, you know, I, I really do hope that we get a good, uh, a good input to, to that. So I'll just need to point you then to the recommendations on pages, um, pages on page 90, those five recommendations. Before I do that, does anybody want to say anything before we move recommendations? Stuart?
Britain uh, and was London, but we're also seeing Conservative councils. He was the Conservative council chairman of Group and uh, He was the Conservative uh, chairman of the Group Association itself, saying, you know, even if you stopped where things are going, if you stopped all discretionary services, there's still a little bit of money to fund uh, you know, the, 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 the stuff we have to do. Um, so that's all full on deaf ears. Um, both, you know, locally, the local conservatives, you know, they, 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 I'm not aware of at once, or on occasion where they've, you know, they've attacked their government for the people who are over. And certainly, it's sort all of full on deaf ears, nationally. And um, then we'll be sound, but voices, you know, called the proper funded local councils because that's where most public services are delivered through. Um, and, and you just get the impression that the government just don't care. The way you can be very new trees is absolutely important. Um, so I think, I think you know, if, if we were properly funded, you can imagine what, you know, what we could actually deliver for people as a labor administration, as social values. I just think it's appalling the way the government is treated. People will and the law will be residents of the local authorities to get in the world. Okay, that's good. Uh, Bernie and then Anita, and then Jim. Yeah, it's almost reversed, isn't it? That the more they, they cut funding and the poorer people get, the more they need our services. So, with the likes of universal credit and all that being put in place, and the government knowing quite well. That universal credit's not working, that universal credit is pushing people into debt. And then when the families fall apart because of poverty, they end up on our doorstep, which is why we've got nearly 840 odd children in there. Um, and it is perverse. And I don't know whether this government is going to look and think if they put more money into things like early intervention. People will be better in the country. We're we'll the sixth richest country in the world, and yet we've got 25 percent of our children living in poverty. How how does that how does that work? How how can this government look at the people in the eye and say that this is correct? And, and Stuart's right. If, if, if we had the money that we needed to look after our children and our older people, we could deliver a marvelous service, and the people of the world would be much better off. They live healthier, happier lives. But it, it's almost as if the government don't want us to do that. It's almost as if the government do not want to provide good services for the people, not just at will, but right the way across the country. So it, it's it's heartbreaking the way we've had to do our budget year in and year out. But we are where we are. Um, and and, and I, I hope the people of will have their say with the consultation because this is your chance to have a say. If anybody out there has got ideas on how we can raise money, that's what the way the company is all about. That's what everything that we're, we're doing to bring money in, that's what it's all about. So I know all of us, I'd be many of us. Somebody had a really good idea of where we could go out and find a total of £100 million, pound, please. Let, let us know. It'd be excellent. We need more than a couple of hundred million, I think. But any, any ideas would be more than welcome. So thank you. Okay, I think so. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I just really wanted to highlight, although we don't know that the, what the levy is going to be for the, for the recycling of waste uh, at this point in time, what we do know is that the tonnage has increased, so that could be an additional pressure on the budget. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jeanette. Yeah, thanks, Phil. It's just to reiterate the point, really, um, <coughs> that what austerity has done to us and why we, we're facing the challenges we are. I mean, I think the UN report that was issued last week <coughs> absolutely nailed it on the head. That this government has inflicted an ideologically driven austerity on women. It's disproportionately affected women, I have to say. You did say if you sat a group of misogynists in a room, they probably would come up with the same policies. And that's deliberate by this government. I don't think they care. They haven't got, they don't uphold or admire the public service ethos. They don't care about the public service. Local authorities. I think they'd be quite happy to uh, just have us all as commissioning councils. It was noticeable when I did uh, present a notice of motion at full council um, maybe a year ago, maybe a bit less, for that demanded fair funding for all local conservatives, which is the basis. So I think that tells us all we do need to know 
about their attitude towards austerity and rural residents. So I would like to finish by saying I hope all our residents do take part in this consultation. You're right, Phil, but we're, we're literally here to listen to what you know to people um, and ideas. But I'm really pleased that we're pushing on with a lot of big innovations that we are with our growth company, with our community, our building. And we're able to do that despite of austerity. Okay, anybody else? Okay. So um so I'll point you to the recommendations on page 90. So we're, we're asking Cabinet to approve financial proposals uh, as I've outlined set out in Appendix 1 for consultation and further consideration by, by Cabinet in, in February. Um, to note the financial challenges facing the Council in setting a sustainable balanced budget for 1920 22 23 We talked about a lot of them in the debate. Thirdly, to know the approach the Council has taken to close the budget gap over that four-year uh, period in order to deliver a sustainable budget. Fourthly, know the approaches the Council is pursuing to ensure future budget sustainability. <clears throat> and finally, agree that, that an updated budget report and medium term financial strategy be brought back to Cabinet on the, the 18th of, of February and then obviously we'll set the budget. So, those recommendations agreed? Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Right, item 11 is the um, Council Tax 2019-20 uh, um, tax base discounts and exemptions and Council Tax Support Scheme. Um, don't particularly want to talk in any detail around this except to just um, highlight uh, a few of the, a few of the uh, proposals, uh, which I know, Jeanette, you wanted to, to particularly mention one or two of these, so I'll ask you to come on. Thanks, Phil. So, so what the Royal Council have done is, is accept care leavers from council tax. So you've exempted them from council tax and you've written off any rooms that have been accrued. And that's all part of our strategy around care leavers and children in the past of so I'm really pleased that we've done that. There's a growing number of councils that are doing it, but we're all among the first to do that. And also the council tax 100% discount that we give to the local refuge. I mentioned previously about how austerity has massively impacted the disproportionate impact on women. Um, and domestic violence is also partially rooted in poverty and austerity. So the fact that we can help women in this way just shows again what a labour administration can do. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Jeanette. So, recommendations on page 105 and 106. So, there's a key word missing from the first recommendation. So, the figure of uh, 93,497,000 will be approved as the council tax base for 2019-20. Yes. Um, item two. Uh, uh, just proves I'm friendly. Uh, uh, item two is the level of the award of. of Local discounts be as set out, and then item three is around the council tax support scheme. Can we agree those recommendations? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, that takes us to um, item 12, which is the council's commercial strategy. Jeanette, I talked about this before. We did. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, our commercial strategy, which has been left, I need to go to work for two things, you're not here, but. Um, Oh, I can't sing her praises enough. Oh, she's there. She is. Uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm making you up. <laughs> I bet you she's been waiting Are you? <laughs> that was really, really timely, Nick, because I was just saying how fantastic you've been and how you've led on our commercial strategy. So, our commercial strategy has been through scrutiny. Um, we also held a commercial strategy event, which Nikki helped all, mainly organise. She was um, very well attended and the feedback has been fantastic from our attendees and other councils. Of course, we have to be a more commercial council because we, we've been speaking the current, the, the, the Fed has been running through this morning, this conversation we brought to the austerity. And, and one of the reasons why we have to develop our commercial strategy is that we need to be a sustainable council going forward to deal with the cuts that come in our way. And that means bringing income into the council on, on, on a sustainable footing. So I would, I'm really, really pleased with our commercial strategy. 
Um, I would like Councillor to endorse it this morning. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Jeanette. And, and I, can I add my um, thanks to particularly Nikki for the work that she's done, but not just Nikki, but the whole office of team around this commercialisation strategy. I think the whole of this agenda actually should be called how to cope with austerity. You know, because can, because this, is a, this is the theme that underpins everything we're doing at the moment. And the commercialisation uh, strategy is a prime example of, of, of how we're doing that. And, and Nikki, um, you know, I know you've led the work on this, but we've had a couple of really successful conferences recently, um, which, which um, you know, has, has uh, brought national speakers to Wimbledon. I think we're seen as, a, as a, one of the leading local authorities in this area. So uh, I echo Jeanette's uh, comments. Uh, thanks to, to everybody who's been involved in this. And I think, uh, again, this is about putting building blocks in place to make sure that the council uh, can, can deliver uh, services going forward which are financially sustainable. And this, so this is a key kind of, of, that, of that theme of, uh, of what we're doing. So the recommendations are before us on page 118, and it's moved. Can we agree those recommendations? <laughs> So I'll just briefly introduce this uh, to say that um, this, this report proposes a, a new model for how we engage with uh, our, our local residents and it builds very much on the, the work that uh, former councillor Matthew Patrick um, initiated when he was cabinet member for community engagement. Um, and basically this is um, proposing that we uh, move to a model which uh, is based on on ward member budgets, and and I, you know, without going into the, the kind of details, I think the, the the experience of constituency committees has been mixed and patchy. Um, <laughs> if I'm being if I'm being charitable, um, uh, some areas they've worked okay. In other areas, they haven't, in all honesty, really engaged the public and led to that um, kind of, uh, you know, the, the real kind of uh, um, meaningful engagement with our local residents and communities. Um, so this is a new model that I think is worthy of, of um, uh, trying out. It's, it's basically putting the power in the hands of local ward members. And, and essentially the, the idea is to, first of all, increase the size of the overall pot. So we're, we're, we're going to do that to the tune of an additional 50,000. So no, no one will lose out from what we're currently spending in this area. But it basically puts the power in the hands of local board members to come up with pro projects, proposals, and to, you know, for me, Mem ward members are the people who know what's going on in their patch. They know what the need is in their areas. They know who the key community groups are that they need to uh, interface with. So I think it makes perfect sense to say the building blocks really should be local ward members. So the the proposal does just that. It, as I say, increases the funding, but for me it kind of Importantly, it weights it um, by deprivation, particularly. So, you know, the needs are not the same everywhere. And I think it's right that we put more money into those uh, areas represented by members which suffer particularly challenging uh, kind of levels of poverty and, and deprivation. Um, I think, uh, for me, this recognises one of the key lessons from the review that Matthew did that a one size fits all formula. Actually, is not doesn't work with because you know not everywhere is the same. So for me, this gives maximum flexibility for ward members to work uh, collectively within a ward or across wards, you know, a cluster of wards maybe, or even at a constituency level. Um, so there is there is I think a lot of room for manoeuvre in how this is is developed. 
Clearly, you know, in the report, there's, there's proposals for how members will get support from officers around this. Uh, we've got some really excellent staff that have supported the constituency committees. We want them to play a slightly different role under, under this uh, model. And also, we clearly need to put in place uh, proper uh, procedures around accountability and transparency for how um, funding proposals are signed off and they're detailed in the report. But critically, there's an appendix which sets out the kind of criteria that we'd be looking for to qualify for funding, and that specifically focuses on things like the rural plan and the 20 pledges. Um, so you will have to take the cognizance of, of, of that. I think that's right because you know that's the overall kind of framework that we're all working to, isn't it? And it was agreed by all parties you know we're back in, in 2015. So I, I personally think that this is a this is a, a good way forward. Um, the proposal is that this is introduced in the municipal year uh, and that we um, we do an annual review uh, and evaluation. Um, but I think this is a this is a, a an exciting way forward and as I say I reiterate it puts the power in the hands of individual individual ward members to decide how this money is best deployed. So recommendations are, are set out in detail on pages 148. But does anybody want to come in and say anything, Stuart and then Paul? Um, yeah, I'm uh, very grateful to what to say really that, you know, we now are up to endorse the rural um, together strategy and I think these kind of tailor-made um, arrangements, you know, for our individual communities um, and constituencies uh, are, are, you know, excellent and really, you know, really exciting so I look forward to playing my part in that. Okay, anybody else? Um, so, recommendations are on page 148. I just need to clarify on item um, C. Can you count the number of our communities? Is, is myself, I think. I think that's it. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I just wanted to check on that. Okay. So, this will go on to full council E. E, item E. 
to the provisions. Okay, yeah, okay, so I'll lose the Very good. Okay, so I'll move those recommendations. I agreed. Yes. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so we're going to move on to. I've not been notified of uh, any other urgent business, um, so I now need to, uh, under item 15, propose the um, exempt uh, motion to exclude the passing public. We've got a couple of items which are um, commercially confidential, so can I agree that, can I move that resolution to exclude the passing public? Is that seconded? Is that agreed? So can I thank the press and public for their attendance and ask them to please um, depart at this point? Thank you.